Um, so our next speaker is David Vine. He is an associate professor of anthropology at American University right here. His work concentrates on Indian American bases in other countries, and, uh, and uh, he will be followed by uh, Koshue Aki uh, Bayashi, uh, who is the international president of the, of the uh, pres excuse me, the international president of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She is a feminist researcher and activist, and uh, coming from Japan, she has a lot to say about closing bases. So David will speak first. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. I know we're standing in the way of your getting to lunch, so I thought I'd you know, try to enliven things and um, get things going. Um, but I do want to say a very quick thank, thanks to World Beyond War, um, to Leah, to, to David Swanson, to everyone at AU who made this possible, um, to Kazue, who I'm very excited to be presenting with. We're going to try to talk quickly so that we can turn to discussion and questions and answers um, as quickly as possible. Um, I'd like to start, though, by asking how many folks have thought about uh, US military bases overseas. <laughs> That's what I imagined. Um, so because I'm speaking to a very knowledgeable audience, I'm going to focus on what I see as some less well-known facets of the United States' collection, of what are now around 800 US military bases overseas. Let's see if I can do this. I think most of you know, more or less, that the United States military encircles the globe with roughly 800 bases outside the United States and around 80 foreign countries on other people's land. I think most of you know that this collection of bases is a relatively new and unusual phenomenon in US history, that while the United States has had bases outside its own territory since around the time of independence, the creation of a truly global system of hundreds upon hundreds of foreign bases dates to World War II and the earliest days of the Cold War. These maps depict the evolution of this system of bases. And it was in these earliest days of the Cold War when US leaders sought to use overseas bases as a way to ensure what they saw as permanent US security and permanent US global dominance. So I'm going to focus on two aspects of the overseas base infrastructure that I think have received less attention. First, I'm going to take on the primary argument and major foreign policy tenant underlying the maintenance of hundreds of US bases overseas. That's what's known as the forward strategy, the idea that maintaining large numbers of bases is essential to protecting the United States, to deterring enemies, and to ensuring global peace and security. Second, I'll focus on the costs, the costs that run into the hundreds of billions of dollars to maintain hundreds of bases and hundreds of thousands of US troops abroad. I'm going to do this because I think it's critical to, to explain and to show that bases abroad don't just harm local citizens, which they very much do, as we'll learn, but then in a variety of ways, they harm, they harm US citizens as well, beginning with the tax dollars we waste and what we're not spending money on as a result. So again, given the knowledge in the room, I think most of you know well that US bases abroad cause a series of often rather horrific damage to local populations, local communities, local countries. I think most of you know about the crimes and accidents, like recurring rapes and murders, in Okinawa, 
that Kazue will discuss in important detail momentarily, that are regular features of the base world, and how crimes and accidents and simple occupation have consistently generated anger, protest, and opposition among locals. I think most of you know that overseas bases have caused widespread environmental damage. I think most of you know that bases have all too often created systems of institutionalized and exploitative camp town prostitution in places like South Korea and beyond. I think most of you understand that camp town prostitution helps produce a kind of militarized masculinity in the US military and contributes to the widespread dehumanization of women, helping to shape the military's epidemic of sexual assault and harassment. I think most of you know that the disproportionate presence of bases in places that lack full democratic rights within the United States, such as Guam and Puerto Rico, has helped perpetuate US colonialism into the 21st century. I think most of you know that the US military, unfortunately, has a long track record of displacing local populations, often indigenous peoples in particular, from the millions of Native Americans displaced, dispossessed, and killed with the help of US Army forts on native lands, to some 20 cases of displacement since 1898 alone in places like Vieques, Okinawa, Guam, Greenland, and on the Indian Ocean island of Diego Garcia. I also think most of you know that bases abroad have helped support human rights abusing militaries, repressive regimes, and dictators in at least 33 undemocratic countries, such as Bahrain, Qatar, Singapore, Honduras, Djibouti, and Ethiopia, to name just a few. And as you can see, a fair number of those undemocratic countries are in Africa where the US military's presence has been, has been growing dramatically in the last 15 years. Finally, and not to be overlooked, I think most of you know that among those who suffer from the spread of overseas bases are US military personnel themselves and their family members, given the strain of distant deployments, family separations, frequent moves, and of course the death that comes with the wars enabled by US bases overseas. So again, let me focus instead on the forward strategy. That is the Cold War idea that the United States must have a large collection of bases and hundreds of thousands of troops permanently stationed overseas to ensure US security. Today, a quarter century after the Cold War's end, in a world without another superpower rival, many across the political spectrum believe as a matter of quasi-religious faith that overseas bases and troops are essential to protecting the country. At a time when bipartisanship has hit all-time lows, there are few issues more widely agreed upon by Republicans and Democrats alike, not to mention national security experts, journalists, military officials, and others. So the primary argument in favor of the forward strategy has long been that overseas bases keep the peace and make the United States and the world safer and more secure by supporting allies and deterring enemies. After 15 years studying the issue, I have a simple response. Prove it. Prove it. Prove to me that maintaining US bases abroad keeps the peace and makes the United States and the world safer. Show me the evidence. Show us the evidence. For decades, supporters of the overseas base status quo have simply proclaimed the security benefits of foreign bases as self-evident truth. Rarely has anyone forced them to back up their claims. Again, I say, prove it. If you look for evidence, you'll see that scholarly debates about the effectiveness of various strategies of military deterrence have raged for decades without end. While there is some evidence that in some cases, military forces can deter imminent threats, there is no conclusive evidence showing that overseas bases, like those the US military maintains, are an effective form of long-term deterrence. This is not to say that foreign bases never contribute to security. The intellectually honest truth, I think, is that evaluating the effect foreign bases have on security is an extremely difficult undertaking. Often, if not always, people come down on one side or another based not on evidence, but on a set of underlying beliefs and assumptions about military force and foreign policy. 
While there's no conclusive evidence to say that overseas bases make the United States or the world safer or more secure, there's abundant evidence that, that overseas bases are harming the safety, security, and well-being of millions, as I've just mentioned briefly, ranging from locals to military personnel and their families. There's also clear evidence that US bases and troops abroad have actually either spawned violence against US Americans or provided convenient targets for attacks, such as in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia. US occupation of Muslim Holy Lands in Saudi Arabia was a major recruiting tool for Al Qaeda, of course, and part of Osama bin Laden's professed motivation for the attacks of September 11th, 2001. The US lives lost, of course, are just a small proportion of the total death and destruction linked to this worldwide, worldwide system of bases. Far from being defensive in nature, evidence again clearly shows that US bases abroad have enabled the launching of a series of military interventions, offensive wars, and drone strikes, which have resulted in repeated disasters, causing, costing millions of lives and untold destruction from Vietnam to Afghanistan and Iraq. In fact, the argument that bases abroad are defensive in nature and that they keep the peace should be laughable. By making it easier to wage foreign wars, bases overseas have ensured that military action is an ever more attractive option, often the only imaginable option for US policymakers. Similarly, rather than stabilizing dangerous regions, foreign bases frequently heighten military tensions and discourage diplomatic solutions to crises. Placing US borders near the borders of China, Russia, and Iran increases threats to their security and encourage them to respond by boosting their own military spending and activity. Imagine how US leaders or the US public would respond if China were to build even a single small base in Mexico. People would be calling for more than a wall, I'd suggest. Just as the war on terror has become a global war that only seems to spread terror, the creation of new US bases to protect against imagined future Chinese and Russian threats runs the risk of becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. These bases are likely helping to create the very threat they are supposedly designed to protect against. In other words, far from making the world safer, US bases can actually make war more likely and the country less secure. In short, it's long, long past time the foreign policy establishment turned toward an evidence-based foreign policy, which shows that maintaining hundreds of bases overseas is just simply an outdated military strategy designed for the Cold War that's undermining national and global security, distracting our military from actually protecting the United States, and taking money from pressing domestic needs. And that's where I'll turn now briefly, so I can turn things over to Kazue in a moment. Simply put, it is very expensive. Simply put, it's very expensive to support hundreds of thousands of troops and family members on bases that frequently look like American towns, complete with housing, hospitals, schools, golf courses, and shopping malls. Each year, US taxpayers pay on average 10,000 to 40,000 more per service member stationed abroad compared to stationing them at home. By my very conservative calculations, US taxpayers are now spending a total of around $150 billion a year to keep bases and troops on foreign soil. That's more than the budget of every government agency except the Defense Department, so-called Defense Department itself. Some, of course, defend overseas bases because they create jobs. Um, I'm actually going to skip that so I can move quickly because I fear that I'm going to go over time. Um, but suffice it to say, this should be an easy political fix compared to closing domestic bases um, because there are actually economic benefits to be gained for uh, members of Congress, senators, uh, to bring in bringing bases back to the United States. Let me end then by telling you about the life and sadly the death of private first class Russell Madden, which I think is illustrative. He was a member of an ar army unit based in Germany. This is Russell with his then four-year-old son, Parker Lee. Russell enlisted in the army at 29 because he didn't have health insurance, 
to cover treatment for Parker's cystic fibrosis. He joined because he knew that Parker would be taken care of no matter what, Russell's sister said. Russell's mother, Peggy Madden, told me Russell enlisted soon after they tried to get treatment for, for Parker at the Mayo Clinic, where they were turned away because Russell lacked health insurance. No one will ever send my son away again, Peggy remembers Russell saying. On June 23, 2010, Russell died in Afghanistan of blast injuries after a rocket-propelled grenade tore through, his tore through his vehicle. After Russell's death, his mother Peggy received a letter from President Obama. I'm deeply saddened to learn of the loss of your son, the letter began. Our nation will not forget his sacrifice, and we can never repay our debt to your family, it continued. After reading the letter, Peggy turned it over, addressed a response to President Obama on the back, and sent it to the White House. She wrote, if my son had found a decent employer and sufficient health insurance in this great land of ours, my son would not have had to sacrifice his life for his son. She'll be happy to hear that. I will pass that along. She, of course, did not receive a reply from the president. Russell Madden's death help, helps expose the life and death significance of the choices connected to our hundreds of foreign bases. Unlike virtually all the wealthy industrialized, industrialized countries in which the United States maintains bases, the United States does not, of course, provide health care to all its citizens. This means parents have had to face the choice Russell Madden faced, have your child go without health care, or risk the chance that your child will lose a parent by joining the military. The hundreds of billions of dollars that we've spent on bases and the trillions we've spent on the military more broadly since World War II are a reminder of the trade-offs involved and reflected in this base nation we've created. Investments in bases have come at the cost of decades neglecting investments in transportation, health, education, housing, infrastructure, and other human needs. Think about what $150 billion per year going into the base world could do for the country's education, health care, and other needs, not to mention needs abroad. In 1953, President Eisenhower, over there on the wall, called this diversion of funds a theft. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. If he were alive today, I think President Eisenhower would similarly say, every base that is built, every base that is expanded, every base that is maintained, signifies, in the final sense, a theft, a theft from the people of the United States, a theft from the people of the world, a theft from all of us. Thank you. Thank you.